You know, I came across something kind of interesting today. Do, you, do any of you guys in the mumble room ever struggle with like anxiety problems or things like that? Anybody ever have battle with that kind of stuff? I know like it's kind of not like a normally socially acceptable thing to talk about, but I think a lot of geeks and probably the geekier you are sometimes, the more likely you could be to have some sort of anxiety problems. Maybe there's social anxiety. Maybe it's just, you know, stress anxiety. I found a really interesting article today that kind of put it all in perspective. That, you know, it felt like it connected me to one of the OG geeks, uh, and that is uh, Darwin. There's a post over on brainpickings.org that was posted on the 28th of last month. And it goes into detail on Darwin's struggle with anxiety. And there's a couple of interesting things in the article uh, that I found. Uh, So uh, here is a quote from Darwin that he wrote in uh, 1865. He says, For 25 years, extreme spasmodic and daily and nightly flatulence, occasional vomiting, on two occasions prolonged for months, vomiting preceded by shivering, hysterical crying, a dying cessation or half faint and copious uh, uh, pallid urine. I'm not even sure what that is. He says, Now I have vomiting and every passage of flatulence preceded by a ringing of my ears. He says, I have nervousness, I have nervousness uh, when E leaves me, and E refers to his wife. He, he, he would be struck with a horrible anxiety. He goes on to say that uh, this, the, the, this was in a chronicle of Darwin's problems. It says, uh, Darwin was frustrated that dozens of physicians, beginning with his own father, had failed to cure him. By the time he wrote to Dr. Chapman, Darwin had spent most of the past three decades, during which time he struggled to write on the origin of species because of his anxiety. Uh, He was bound to his household. Based on his diaries and letters, it's fair to say he spent a full third of his daytime hours since the age of 28 either vomiting or lying in bed because of crippling anxiety. You know, you hear a lot about, you know, like you hear a lot about like these historical figures, but you don't ever hear about this part, do you? You never hear too much about the background. And, the, it, and their own personal really struggles like this. Oh, yeah. And, you know, a lot of people have uh, struggles with anxiety. I, for one, am somebody who suffers from anxiety disorder, not otherwise specified. I've actually been diagnosed. And, yeah, I can totally relate to that. Do I believe in Darwin's philosophies? No. But <laughs> that's just because of all sorts of other factors. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. In, terms of, in terms of struggling with anxiety, I totally get that. Yeah, and uh, I think it's something that a lot of intelligent people are probably afflicted by a lot too because your mind maybe wanders more than it should or faster than yes. you can control it. Yes, in some and that's, cases. That, I, I have described that over and over again to friends and family is that like at night, my mind will just take all sorts of different paths, which is why mm-hmm. I have to read before I go to bed. Otherwise, I don't sleep. You got to do because- what I do. Yeah. Uh, just call up Aaron Saigo and then hang up after he answers the phone. Yeah. That's what I, that yeah. makes me oh. feel better. <laughs> huh. He's in here with hey us. Hey there, Aaron. <laughs> hey, I, I, I always wondered if that was you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought maybe you'd recognize the breathing, but it's fine. I, I, I hoped. Uh, well, I'm, I'm glad you could join us today. Congrats on the new project, by the way. That's very cool. Very cool. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I, I suppose you're referring to the um, Luminosity reboot. Yes. Yeah. Welcome to Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that always recommends building your own online photo backup. My name is Chris. And my name is Matt. Hey there, Matt. Happy uh, post-Labor Day to you. Are you all rested up and ready to go? we got a big show today. Absolutely. Joining us in just a little bit will be Aaron Saigo. He's launching a new project that I'm pretty excited about. And he's also been talking a lot about convergence. What is the desktop? What are laptops? Where does mobile fit into all of this? Sort of really doing a good a meta-analysis of a lot of things we've been talking about lately, so we'll chat with him in just a bit. I'm excited about that. Plus, I don't know if you caught it, we mentioned it earlier, but Linus was at DebConf, the Debian conference, and I guess they had it in Portland, so Linus showed up. You know, he just threw on his socks, then he threw on his sandals, in that order, like a man, <laughs> went down there and talked to the DebConf folks about what was going on, and I love it. We're only going to, I haven't even seen the whole video yet, but the first five minutes of the video are like, I got to play this in the show. Because he, he goes into a rant, and he perfectly summarizes kind of what's wrong with distributions. And it turns out kind of around the same time, the System D Cabal, at, they call about them themselves, I'm not making that up, the System D Cabal thinks they have a solution to some of Linus's complaints. 
Uh, and also, if we have a little time, we'll see. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not quite sure, but if we have a little time, we'll also discuss uh, Fedora's future package manager, what it can do and what it can't do quite yet. But what you should be seeing starting in Fedora 21 and why DNF might be a big deal. But first, Matt, as is tradition on the Linux Unplugged show, it is time for emails. Dave writes in on a pre-show discussion we had a week or so ago about systemd. He says, hey, guys, I've been listening to Linux podcasts for a few months. I enjoy them very much. Your discussion of system D seemed to come down to innovation versus stability. I've seen this tension throughout my 30-year career in the Unix arena and in the past 20 developing a couple of big commercial Unix operating systems. Customers love stability, and many will play stability over innovation to a large degree. Innovation in these operating systems has to come from something completely new that doesn't disturb the old stable features. Well, or, at defined points, where an OS vendor can warn the customers there could be breakage ahead. What we're seeing play out in the Linux arena is a maturing of the operating system and a growing group of users valuing stability over innovation, particularly when innovation is disruptive. Fortunately, with Linux, the different distributions are free to introduce these innovations in ways that make sense for them. E.g., I wouldn't expect Red Hat to put systemd into Red Hat Enterprise Linux for a while, but other distributions might choose to jump right in. And I, I don't know if I totally, completely agree that it, it comes down to the camp that likes systemd is for innovation and the camp that doesn't like systemd is for stability because, um, A, it implies... Yeah, I can't speak to that. Yeah, it to me implies, like, um, the people that don't want systemd are curmudgeons and, like, they're afraid of change. Far. I wouldn't go that far, but I think it's assuming a lot in both directions, and I wouldn't go necessarily go there because I don't know yeah, what their opinions and I thoughts agree. are on it. I agree. I think it is going too far. Uh, and I, I think that there's sometimes it comes, it's not so much about avoiding change as it is just a philosophy disagreement. And that's what makes it. That, that it, I would agree with. It's a multi spectrum thing, I suppose. It's some from it's some of people that are curmudgeons about change. It's some people who don't like the design. It's some people who don't like the people behind the design. It's some people who question the political reasons. It's all of these things that make it into one big issue. Then that's why it won't die. If it was just one or two things, people could rationally debate and argue it and shut that down. It's not just one thing, though. True. Jeremy writes in. He says, my thought on Linux desktop managers. Get ready for this, Matt. Are you ready? He says, hello, all. Ready? Thanks for the Jupiter Broadcasting netcasts. And he says, not just netcasts, but resources as well. Now, I'm thinking, I'm wondering if... It's for people who like to mess with computers. I'm wondering if he's a, Le a Leo fan. He says, but he likes the netcast. You, you caught that with netcast, yeah. huh? I says, I recently <laughs> wrote a little blurb slash yeah. rant on my thoughts of Linux desktop managers. Yeah. He said, and he links us to it. I'll, I'll read a highlight from a second. But the TLDR is I avoid all desktop managers and I run my own lean environment, which makes my life easier. And here's what he does, Matt. Get ready for this. So okay. uh, he wrote on his blog, he says, I've always felt that at some point someone out there would develop a manager that would not try to be an all-encompassing ecosystem, but rather maybe just something that attempted to just simply be a powerful desktop manager. That time, though, never came. It seems that every iteration of every major open-source desktop environment, the wheel is being reinvented again from scratch, and the idea of how things should look, feel, and behave kept changing unnecessarily. They rarely provided any improvements that I felt were positive. So, if I'm not using a desktop manager, what do I use? Well, first of all, I remove the default window manager and replace it with a highly customizable window manager called Sawfish. Sawfish is very customizable with themes, keyboard shortcuts, customizable menus, and scripts. It focuses on being a great window manager and doesn't attempt to be anything else. It's easily exceeded my expectations of what a window manager could be, so I switched to Sawfish about 10 years ago and never looked back. Anybody in the mumble room using Sawfish? Never tried it over here. Nobody in the mumble room is using it either, Matt. Never Nobody. heard of it. No, no. Been around for sounds a while. Sounds cool. I mean, yeah. it sounds compelling, but I just, I don't know. I'd have to, uh, makes me want to try it out, though. <laughs> you know, yeah, I'd be curious to see what you could do with it. And um, I like that he's stuck with yeah. it for 10 years. Yeah, that's really says uh, something. Quick question. Actually. Wasn't wasn't Selfish uh, the window manager in older GNOME releases? Yeah, I was wondering about that, too, actually. Uh, because okay. I, was, I wasn't sure. I didn't want to say anything. Huh. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Googling yeah, it right now. Sawfish. Hmm. I'm gonna search for it right now. Window. Yeah, look at this. I think and it is. I think it was the one point X times. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 That sounds right. Yeah. Here's a screenshot of it actually on uh, on uh, Wikipedia. Boy, that's pretty hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, you could. You I think could... it was. More power to him. 
<laughs> Wasn't it extensible with Lisp or something? Yeah, like and uh, yeah, he he mentions. I think that was the scripting aspect to it, and he also mentions that uh, they have a you know, all the key bindings are totally customizable too, which is kind of cool. I like that too. That's really funny though. Looking at that, huh? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, a little comp file massaging that's fine, but I don't really want to get into scripting something. So I don't know. I it yeah, I'd have to ch- I'd have to kind of weigh that out. Yeah, yeah. Maybe on an older system, that'd be a great way on a yeah, on a resource. Exactly. Or if you have a DigitalOcean droplet, which brings us to our Ooh. first sponsor this week, DigitalOcean. And you know, I, I mentioned if you have a DigitalOcean droplet, I actually have a droplet up there that I've installed Exxon. And <laughs> you're gonna laugh at me, audience, but. You got to understand the way I work. I even installed Chrome on my DigitalOcean droplet. I SSH in, I turn on compression and X1114, and then I can manage all of my server side stuff just using localhost. And I don't have to expose any of that stuff to the web. And that's just another layer of security for me. So for me, because I'm always on an X11 based system, well, for now at least, I can SSH in. You guys know about SSH and X1114. You use compression, it runs like a champ, and you can start Chrome up. And and to be honest, I've actually had more success with Firefox. I have both of them (laughs) installed and and Opera too. I have Opera installed. Hey, man, That's I can't funny. help it. You know, Firefox runs really well under X1140. Uh, yeah, it does. It does work quite well, as a matter of fact. Mm. Uh, so there's a lot of options you could do with a DigitalOcean droplet. Go over to DigitalOcean.com and arm yourself with the knowledge of Unplug September. That's the promo code you're going to want to keep in mind as I tell you about DigitalOcean because it's going to get you a $10 credit. So what is DigitalOcean? It's a simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up a cloud server. And users can create a cloud server in under 55 seconds or 25 seconds if you're our audience. And the pricing plans are incredible. They start only $5 a month for 512 megabytes of RAM. That gets you also a 20 gigabyte hard drive, one blazing fast CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. DigitalOcean also has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, and London. Their interface is simple, and their control panel is crazy intuitive. But on top of all of that, they have an amazing, straightforward, simple API You could just write your own scripts against or take advantage of any of the community applications that are out there. There's plenty of them that you can get your hands on. They're really nice, too, because once you get a system spun up, you still have the option to do one-click deployment of applications. You're like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, they're going to use Docker to do some of that stuff. How cool is that? They're using KVM for the virtualization, and they're sitting on top of those SSD drives, and they work their butts off to make sure that they're at some of the best data centers in the world. They just spun up a new one with IPv6 in New York. They got that new one in London. They're growing like crazy. Tons of you out there in the community have been trying out DigitalOcean because it's worked so many for you. That's why they invested in those SSD drives, to get you that performance. That's why they use the amazing hardware all wrapped up in this incredible interface. They recognize that it takes all of that together to make an amazing product. And go over to DigitalOcean.com and use the promo code Unplug September. Unplug September. You get a $10 credit. You can try out the $5 rig that I've been getting a heck of a lot of use out of for two months for absolutely free. DigitalOcean.com and the promo code Unplugged September. And a really big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the Linux Unplugged Show. Love my DO droplets. Uh, I got multiple now. It's like phones up in here with me, Matt. It's like phones. I yeah, I think, I think you've got me beat. I had like four of them at the peak. I dropped back to three, yeah. and I'm actually looking at doing a fourth one again. Ooh, what so. are you running on there? Are you, are you doing WordPress? I'm doing. I'm actually doing more WordPress than anything. I'm still rocking uh, my... Um, uh, you know, uh, Bit- BitTorrent sync is big thing for me. I yeah, do buddy. a lot of data back and Good forth for on you. that. But but WordPress, it's like it's the best WordPress experience I've ever had, and yeah. I've had a lot yep. of them. And Same it's here. Really, really smooth. Super fast. Love the plus setup. You, you control it from top mm-hmm. to bottom. And you know, my wife Angela has been talking about how she kind of wants to uh, get back into blogging more regularly. And one of the things yeah. we're thinking about doing is we're we're looking at all the different options, but definitely one of them on the list is. Just set up a WordPress site on a DigitalOcean droplet, and she can manage it even. It's really straightforward. It's kind of awesome. I, I would recommend it. It's fast. It's just DIY, but it's also easy. It's really great. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Matt, so we got a couple more emails we're going to get into. Uh, this next one came from uh, Ryan, and this is a topic I love. First of all, Ryan wants to know, just to clarify off the top, that it, all he has to do to be a guest on the show is take a shower with me, because apparently when Eric was here last week, we implied that Eric took a shower <laughs> with me, and so therefore he was allowed on the show. Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, 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 so, Ryan, just to clarify, uh, that only works under two circumstances. Um, uh-huh. Number one, you're a lady. <laughs> number two, if you're not a lady, I'm really lonely that day. And then if you get me on the right day and you take a shower with me, and I do have a shower here in the studio, I'll probably let you on air. 
I mean, you know, I'm a wow. nice guy after all. I, 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 I'm dumbfounded that that actually wow. made it. So that happened. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, man, so uh, just telling it like it is. And Ryan wanted to know. I, I'm just here to help the people with the information they require. So he says he's That's been a important. listener uh, for a while now. And uh, he wanted to get to his actual question, not just the shower question. He says, I'm relatively new to Linux. I tried to switch my five-year-old desktop last September, but I had to switch it back to Windows for both game-related and school-related reasons. I recently bought a laptop with explicit intent of installing Ubuntu for it took about eight hours because it came pre-installed with Windows 8. Don't get me started on that OS or UEFI. But I got it loaded and it works beautifully. With the next six to eight months, I'm looking to get a refurbished desktop with a faster processor, more RAM slots, and the MMOs I want for it aren't friendly with Linux. So unfortunately, Windows 7 for that one. Once I get the second desktop, I'll be looking to repurpose my current desktop as a local file server for cohabitating my girlfriend and my files with a little backup action. She has a Windows-based PC, so we have a mixed OS environment. When I repurpose it, I plan on using Linux for this new machine. What would be your top choices for distros to use for a home file server? I'm going to set this up in VirtualBox on my laptop in the meantime so I can play around with it before I actually go into it and put it in production says, uh, thanks for everything, and I hope we had a great Labor Day. So uh, I have a few suggestions. Matt, I'm sure you have a few. Anybody in the Mumba room have a home file server distro recommendation for uh, our uh, uh, email of Ryan here? Not I use read. OpenSUSE. Okay. Not really. Okay. Need, it's not a Linux distro, but I, I can't speak of, uh, speak of free NAS high enough. I, I run an open media file. Yeah, um, something's up, guys. No, go ahead. I'm just seeing what else. I was just giving you guys a chance to uh, say. Which, so we got OpenE oh, okay, Evolve, FreeNAS. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, what else? What else we use? Yeah, I, well, I just use S SFTP into a uh, um, OpenSUSE server. OpenSUSE server. And that's how I get my stuff done. Matt, yeah. do you yeah. think, uh, I mean, come on. I mean, Nobody's going to say Ubuntu LTS, right? Come on, right? But Matt, that makes a good file server. on Ubuntu. I, well, I think Ubuntu is good. Um, I think anything Debian based is certainly worthwhile. There you go. Um, that's kind of my go to thing. I think really moving more toward a Debian situation is just a comfortable place to be. I like that. I think even if it's not Ubuntu, I think Debian's good. I also think uh, OpenSUSE, like the Evergreen release, would be quite good. Wouldn't True. recommend Fedora. And if you're uh, in the Red Hat camp, check out CentOS. That's also a pretty solid option to go. Uh, but uh, like Wimpy says, Open Media Vault also also a great opportunity to look into. And one we're going to do a review on soon here on the show. Maybe we should do that next week. Those of you doing the Open Media Revolt, would you be ready to do the review next week? Yep. Okay. Uh, yep. Okay. So we'll do on Linux Unplugged next week, unless something changes, we'll have our review of Open Media Vault, Ryan. So that might help you as well. Okay, last but not least, Sean writes in with the real cost of a MacBook. He says, I know I'm a little behind on this comment, but I just started looking to Linux within the past year, and I came across Linux Action Show a few months ago, and he's been catching up. I have a MacBook from the spring of 2008. It runs better than Windows was my thought when I bought it. <laughs> mm. Now my thought is I can only run up to 10.7, and that's as far as I can go. In fact, he's stuck at 10.68 right now because, as some of you may or may not know, after a little while, Apple kind of discontinues support for these older MacBooks, and they don't really allow you to install the newer OSs on them anymore after a point. He says, I tried running Linux distros on a VM in the MacBook, but it's slow and sketchy. So I know I'm stuck with it for a while, but I got a hold of a couple of old desktops, and I've been running Ubuntu 14.4, as, and, set, I want, uh, and I want to set one up as a home server as well. So I've downloaded CentOS. Well, there you go. All that is nice. to say, the inability to move forward without shelling out major cash for a new hardware has made me look back towards Linux. Also getting back into computers, and I'm in the process of getting an A+. And looking at a Linux 101 course. So he says, keep up the great work. Boy, isn't that true, though, about the MacBooks? Is like One of the things is, is you could throw Linux on there and probably get a couple more years out of that, right? I think that's really it, because I think that really when you're in their own ecosystem, they set the rules, they set the pace, and you're limited to whatever they want to do with you. I, for example, have a uh, old PowerPC a Mac Mini that runs uh, Linux. And the reason why is because that's all you're going to do with it, short of using it as a doorstop. It's not, it doesn't have any uh, benefit in the OS X universe. So, Very good. Very good. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we have... Uh, uh, we I we're having some connection problems with Aaron, so uh, we'll see if he's able to make it back on. Oh, okay. I, will, I hope he can. If not, we'll still give him a good plug for his project he's working on because it's pretty exciting. So uh, what we'll do in the meantime, as uh, the guys work that out on the server end, is I'll tell you a little bit about our next sponsor, and that's Linux Academy. And Linux Academy is a great sponsor 
for the Linux Unplugged show because it's an opportunity for anyone in the audience that's learned on their own or like if you're like me, self-taught on the job, you'd be surprised going back and taking some of these fundamentals, how much little bits of details they'll fill in. And, and in my case, at least, I won't speak for you. In my case, I learned, oh, I could have been saving myself quite a bit of time <laughs> <laughs> if I had learned this the right way. You ever had that? Right. Where you're like, oh, oh I guess I could have done this a lot easier. I've been doing this the hard way the whole time. So I have that at least once a week. So yeah. <laughs> so, so here's just a little friendly a reminder from someone who's been in this position. Uh, maybe it's time to just check up on things. Go over to linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. That's going to get you the summer of learning discount. You should go jump on that right now because it's a 33% off offer. And Linux Academy is offering new content every single week. So you're going to want that sub. So what is Linux Academy? Let me tell you. It's kind of an awesome service created by Linux enthusiasts and educators who really wanted to put something together that Linux users could go to and know they're getting really good content from people who love Linux. They have step-by-step -step video courses, downloadable comprehensive study guides, and each course, when you need it, comes with its own server, spins it right up. You can pick from seven plus Linux distributions and they'll automatically adjust the courseware to match the distribution you've picked. So if you're a Red Hat guy and you need to get in on a little bit of Debian, you can take care of that or vice versa. It's really kind of neat. And I've heard from a lot of you out there who've tried this out and say, you know, you mentioned the downloadable comprehensive study guides. You didn't mention that was also video and audio that happens to work really well as a podcast. Or you forgot to sometimes mention they do live events that so you can ask the educator directly when you've been taking courses. I love all of that. But me, I'm a recluse. I sit up in my, on my office late at night when I'm not sleeping very well or when I want to accomplish a little something, get a little intellectual stimulation. I bring up my Linux Academy dashboard. I look at how long a course is going to take me and then I just go to town on it. And sometimes that's a scenario where I'm building something from beginning to end on S3 using S3, EC2, all of the Amazon web services, or maybe it's something on a Linux box. It's maybe something using OpenStack because it's not something I've had a lot of in-production experience with, but I still want to talk about it from an educated standpoint. That's what I love about Linux Academy is they're constantly adding this new stuff that I can continue to test myself, see where I'm at. They give me progress reports, and I can also see if there's a new kind of technology that's coming up that interests me, that sort of excites me, because it's um, sometimes you run the risk when you work on a particular area of getting a little stale. This is my opportunity to prevent that. Go over to linuxacademy.com. Check out their OpenStack Essentials. It's now 100% complete with tons of content. Their AWS certified SysOps Administrator Prep course has over 14 hours of content that you can check out. I think it's a pretty neat system. linuxacademy.com slash unplugged to get that summer of learning discount. Go over there right now. Let them know you appreciate them supporting the Linux Unplugged show. That's linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. And a really big thank you to Linux Academy for sponsoring the Linux Unplugged show. Check them out, guys. They're great. I don't see Aaron back just yet. So while okay. we work on that, I got another topic. We can we can move to our next topic because this we've actually got we've got way more show than we can fit anyway. So either way, we're totally fine. Uh, and the the meta story we've been covering is is it too late for the Linux desktop? We covered John C. Dvorak's trolling and Linux action oh. show, right? And then the week before, actually for like the last couple of weeks on Linux Unplugged, we've been talking about sort of the perceived threat that the Mac desktop represents to uh, the success for Linux on the desktop. Well, uh, this past week, Linus Torvalds, uh, your buddy and mine, was over at, uh, he actually wasn't just over there, he, he lives in Portland, so it's not that far for him to go, but he was at the uh, DebComp 14 in Portland, and Linus is style these days is to do more of like a Q&A session than it is so much to go up there and do like a big speech. And so he sat and just kind of right off the top of his talk, started taking questions from the audience. It's kind of cool when he does that too, because, yeah. you know, anything goes, right? And it's not like it's this pre-manicured experience where he's going to hit on these bullet points and go out there and give the Linux talking point speech and really pitch Linux to all of the people. He's just a guy <laughs> going out there answering questions. And I love that about him. So uh, the first question is the one we're going to start with today. And then we'll move into uh, what the System Decabal is trying to do to address this. And uh, I think it should be for an interesting discussion. So I'll start with Linus's uh, question here. The, uh, it should be, I think he's wrapping up a statement, and then the question begins, and we'll let him go for a bit. It's a great talk. I have a really hard time just doing something else, because that means I have to switch over all my kids' machines, my wife's machine, and, and, uh, and that's just painful. So that's why. OK, so this is a, a little difficult. Um, I, I guess we're all, at least for me, I'm kind of wondering uh, very much like I think you are lately, 
how to get to the year of the Linux desktop, if you will, right? Wow. All right? And we'd all like it to be the year of the Debian desktop, if possible. And I'm trying to figure out, if anything, if you have any insight as to possibly how to get closer or towards that, if, if anything. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that are getting closer to that. And I, I think, I mean, I, people, technical people don't tend to use Chromebooks, but I think that Chromebooks are the kind of thing that will make the year of the desktop more possible, right? Because once people get used to running their applications basically as a browser, uh, that makes a lot of things much easier. That said, let me go on my first rant of the evening, right? Uh, one of the problems desktop has, I mean, ignoring all the purely market and getting free installs and making it just so that normal people, and by normal people I mean obviously non-technical people, will just buy a machine and it just works. One of the things that none of the, des the distributions have ever gotten right is application packaging, right? Um, and now somebody will say, hey, dpackage is way improved and much better than RPM, and that's not at all what I'm talking about. Um, I'm talking about actual application writers that want to make a package of their application for Linux. And I've seen this firsthand with the other project I've been involved with, which is my Divelog application, right? Um, we make binaries for Windows and OS X. We basically don't make binaries for Linux. Ouch, that's Linus, ouch. Why? Wow. Because making binaries for Linux desktop applications is a major fucking pain in the ass, <laughs> right? You don't make binaries for Linux, you make binaries for Fedora 19, Fedora 20, maybe there's even like RHEL 5 from 10 years ago. You make binaries for uh, Debian Stable. Well, actually, you don't make binaries for Debian Stable because Debian Stable has libraries that are so old that anything that was built in the last century doesn't work, right? But you might make binaries available for Debian, whatever the code name is, for, for unstable. And, uh, and even that is a major pain because, Christ, we had this small local flame fest just a couple of days ago. Um, Damien has these rules that you're supposed to use shared libraries, right? And if you don't use shared libraries, uh, getting your package in, like, is just painful. But using shared libraries is not an option when the libraries are experimental and the libraries are used by two people and one of them is crazy. So <laughs> every other day some ABI breaks, right? So you actually want to just compile one binary and have it work. Preferably forever and preferably across all the Linux distributions. And uh, I actually think distributions have done a horribly, horribly bad job. One of the things that I do in the kernel, and I have to fight this every single release, and I think it's sad. Go, Linus. Uh, we have one rule in the kernel. There is one rule. We don't break user space. Everything else is kind of a guideline. The whole security thing, it's a guideline that we shouldn't do stupid shit, right? But that's not a hard rule. People do stupid shit all the time. I don't get that upset. People break user space. I get really, really angry. I mean, I, this is something that is religious for me. You do not break user space. And even in the kernel, I, every single release, I have people saying, okay, I'm changing this ABI because it's cleaning stuff up. <laughs> and I'm like, no, you're not changing that ABI because I will crush you, right? Uh, all right, so uh, I'll link to the rest of the talk. There, it's available in WebM if you'd like to watch the uh, whole talk in its entirety. Obviously, it's a good one. I mean, Linus, that's what he does now. He's, he's, I, I love his frankness about these matters. And I think it's so telling that <laughs> Linus does not package his own application for the Linux desktop. He makes binaries for Windows and Mac OS X. Tell me that doesn't sting. That's just, wow. I mean, that, that's really telling, you know? I think, 
I think we could debate all day long if the system's broken or not, or if it's technically feasible or not. But at the end of the day, when the creator of the frickin' Linux kernel <laughs> right. won't package his own software, I think that's an indication of a failure at some point in the system, right? I mean, I think oh, it's, there. and I don't think like a small failure, right? I don't think it's like a small failure. I think it's kind of like a fundamental failure. Am I wrong? Well, it he, seems like he a big said deal. it was a major pain. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, the fact that someone comically earlier asked, "Hey, is you know, when's the year of the desktop coming?" Um, well, there you go. I think these are things that still have to be overcome. Big time, right? I mean, okay. So, is there a solution? In fact, we've had people write in. Matt, you might recall to the Linux Action Show, been like, "Guys, this is so frustrating. Is there ever going to be a solution?" And I kind of joked. I said, ha, I wouldn't worry about it. I'm sure the System D guys will eventually come up with a universal package format for all." Well, guess what? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. What? Guess what? Uh, you might have heard of him. His name is Lenart. Uh, he, he's, done, he's, he's been around. He's done a few things. Um, Avahi. You might be familiar with the Avahi project. It's the uh, auto DNS discovery. Uh, you could be familiar with Pulse Audio, perhaps. Uh, you may have heard of the SystemD project. Uh, you might have be familiar with a company called Red Hat. These are all... Things that you might attribute to Lenart Pottering. Well, another thing you can contribute to Lenart is fundamentally attacking how we put together a Linux system. Changing what defines a distribution forever. And the best part is, it's all powered by ButterFS. <laughs> Of course it is. Of course it's it all is. powered by but I'm sure a little system D's in there too. It feels like a big Reddit meme, doesn't it? All right. Before, <laughs> before we get into this, I can see the mumble room has a few things they want to talk about. Let's start with Fred and then we'll go to Wimpy. Fred, what are your thoughts thus far with that Linus talk and all of that? What are you thinking right now? Yeah, so um, somebody asked him later in the talk if you did watch till the end, uh, you know, he, he built this parse uh, C front end and then he to solve a problem and then he built Git to solve a problem. And then now is he going to build some solution to solve that packaging yeah. problem? Yeah. Yeah. And then he says, no, this is a hard problem. And I actually really do think it's a hard oh, problem. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Big time. I absolutely agree, but it's not hard because of packaging issues. It's hard because um, I just, uh, so I thought up an example while you were playing uh, the video, oh, okay. even containers, I don't think containers can even solve that problem. Let's talk about GTK GT and GTK themes. So now you have this settings application, which you can go in and choose your GTK theme, right? And this changes for all applications, right? So the theme, the same, all applications get the same theme. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, now everybody is statically linking, which uh, doesn't cause problems. But then now everybody is bundling up applications dynamically linked with GTK, but they're just in their own separate container or bundle or whatever you want to call them. Which configuration file do you use to set the theme? Are they separate configuration files? Uh, do you have a separate configuration file for GTK 2 and 3 or for GTK 2.12 and 2.14 or for GTK 2.12.1.2 and things. so on? All of the things, my friend. Yeah, but then you cannot add new settings or, you know, like add more features to right. the configuration yeah, files without point. breaking everything else. Yeah. Well, so uh... how do you do that? And it, this is a simple problem. It, that's not also not so important. Theming is not that important, functionally speaking. But it's a very good example. It's a very good yeah. use case. Something that, that would drive me solved. nuts. Yeah. <laughs> so All right. A few, us, a few uh, of us in the mumble room were talking about this uh, yesterday, I think. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, great. Um, and in general, I am, I am very pro-SystemD. Um, I like SystemD. Uh, and, and I don't mind that they've taken a lot of the low-level stuff. That being said, anything to do with package management and changing that scares me. Because one of the things I... my favorite things about Linux, the thing that I think sits it above every other operating system, is its package management. And I, I'm not saying that this will screw it up, 
I'm just afraid this will screw it up. Right. Or at least screw it up for a little while like Pulse Audio did. Well, I'm going to get into how they're going to pull it off in a second from like a package management standpoint and things like that. But before we do, I wanted to give Wimpy a chance to jump in, then Daredevil, and then we'll get into the meat of what the system do you guys want to do. So Wimpy, uh, what are your thoughts at this point so far? Okay, well, I read uh, Lennart's post this morning. Oh, great. That was my morning reading. Yeah, so okay. I had some time to think about that on the commute into work. And I read it again. And had to think about it on the yeah. way home. Yeah, I had. Re- I read it twice too, and I'm still I th- thinking about it. Yeah, I, th- I was going to say, I think, I think it needs a third read to really absorb it. Mm-hmm. But um, I think he, he and his team are very good at tackling the tough problems and in no the one else world. Will. Yeah, yeah, and what they've fleshed out, I really like. So I, I noticed somebody referred to it in one of the comments as, "Oh, it's it's complicated." And I don't think it's complicated. I think it's complex, but not yeah, complicated. Good point. And if if you're a Python programmer, one of the edicts in the Zen of Python is uh, uh, choose complex over complicated. And it is a difficult problem to solve. So there needs to be some complexity to it. But I really, I'm really quite enamored with the approach. And I say, I say, bring it on. I'm really looking forward to uh, a world in which we can isolate the uh, user environment, the framework environment for the desktop and, and, and meld that with the appropriate configuration yeah. and then keep the stable OS separate from that. I, I'm really excited so, by that. So I would, for those of you who haven't read this yet, I bet a lot of you are probably thinking, you know, this is, they're going to use Docker. This is going to, this is not what, containers can play a role in this, but in a way it almost demotes everything to the same playing level. The, the, the base OS, containers and VMs, uh, in some ways, are are uh, uh, from a file consistency standpoint, are the playing field's a little more leveled. So essentially, you could see why they'd want to do this. And and Lenart summarizes it very well. And Wimpy, please feel free to jump in as 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 I go over this. Uh, he says, "What we want to do is an efficient way for vendors to package their software, regardless if it's just an app or the entire operating system, directly to the end user, and know the precise combination of libraries and packages it will operate within. I.e., you know, if we were to ship a Jupyter Broadcasting media player." The just play Jupiter Broadcasting content was all themed up with our logo and stuff. I'd have no idea what video libraries you might have on your distro. So I would want a way to know what libraries would be used when I gave you the Jupiter Broadcasting app. He says we want to allow end users uh, and administrators to install these packages on their system regardless of which distribution they have it installed on. We want a unified solution that ultimately can cover updates for full systems, OS containers, like Docker, end-user apps, programming ABIs, and more. These updates shall be double-buffered, and what he means by that is, like if you guys have ever had a motherboard that has two BIOSes, or like the way the Mars rover does updates, there's two computers and one, you do one update, and then once you have a successful boot, then you know you update the second install. So you have a, it's a, or in, in actually in the case of their approach, you have infinite buffering depending on your free storage. But they say we want at least in the minimal double buffer. He says there's an absolute nece- necessity if we want to prepare the ground for an operating systems that can manage themselves, that can update safely without administrator involvement, a la. Core OS, or maybe some of the directions Fedora Cloud wants to go in, where yes, the server OS is rolling, but the applications are protected. He says, We want our images to be trustable. Now, this is one that might have some controversy because he means signed. And he doesn't just mean like the application signs, they want a fully trustable OS, starting to sound a little bit like Microsoft here, with images that can be verified by a full trust chain from the firmware meaning secure boot, through the bootloader, through the kernel, all the way up to the init. Cryptographically secure verifications of the code we want to execute is relevant on the desktop, just like Chrome OS does now, but also for apps, for embedded devices, and on servers, particularly in a post-Snowden world. So what they are proposing on how to accomplish this, it's amazing. It's essentially a scheme built around a variety of concepts that are available either today or hopefully soon in ButterFS. I want to caveat something here. Everything they're talking about in ButterFS is in a read-only capacity. So you're not really talking about ButterFS manipulating live data to accomplish this so much as basing it off of snapshotted data and working from that snapshotted data. So before you get too ButterFS freaky, do keep that in mind, although you probably are legitimately concerned. Uh, So they want to use the ButterFS file system namespacing. Uh, There's a large number of features in ButterFS that neatly fit this concept today, he says, and maintainers are busy working on a couple of others they want to eventually make use of. 
as part of the proposal, they will make heavy usage of ButterFS's sub-volume capabilities and introduce a clear naming scheme for them. So you would have a user file system with a vendor ID, the architecture like ARM or x86, and then the version. And these would be these would be volumes that could be mounted and mapped to your file system like a drive. So when an application launches and it needs a particular version for a particular architecture, it thinks it's talking to slash opt slash proprietary garbage slash bin, when in reality it's actually in this deeper ButterFS subvolume that's been mapped to that location. Kind of a little bit like that distribution we talked about a little while ago that would let you run applications from any distro and do a whole bunch of cheruting on the background. Oh, Wim yes. Wimpy, am I getting everything right so far? Yeah, you've totally, totally summarized that correctly. Uh, and they talk about how uh, there, you wouldn't even necessarily have to uh, have a ButterFS file system to do this. A lot of this functionality could be contained within a loopback device that is formatted with ButterFS. So if you still wanted to use XFS or ZFS or extended forward for your primary file system, some of this functionality may be capable of, I, I, I bet that's limited, but I bet some of the functionality could work out of a loopback device. Here's a couple of things that are really, 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 really interesting and would fundamentally change the way software is distributed on Linux. They are taking advantage of a feature built into ButterFS called send and receive. ZFS has something similar where you can take you can take the, the blocks from your, from your drive, from your storage device, and send them over the network, over an SSH connection, or over the SATA cable, and, and write those blocks to another storage device in another computer or on another drive. And it, 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 it's kind of cool. It's kind of crazy because you can just take the whole thing, suck it up, and spit it on another machine and write it all down there. Well, they want to use that same technology to distribute software. So it would be bit by bit exactly what you got. And using some of things like ButterFS's deduplication features and things like that, even though you'd have a lot of the same libraries, on the back end, ButterFS would be doing do deep, uh, dedupe to clean it all up. And they would do delta differentials too. So if you're doing a send and receive of a ButterFS file system, it would just be the bits you don't have. So you would essentially have some delta capability there too. Now, they're also saying all of this doesn't even eliminate RPM or DEB because the distro maintainers would still be building the distros with those tools. This would be more for the users. The users would stop using the package managers as much and would use systems more like this. And they paint a scenario where you know you would have GNOME and LibreOffice and Firefox all doing this system, and it sort of escalate from there. Uh, any, oh, any gaps you need to fill in there, Wimpy? You think? Yeah, yeah. I think I think one thing you've missed there is you mentioned LibreOffice and Firefox, but in in this brave new world, you can have the last six versions of Firefox and the last three versions right. of LibreOffice and the beta release, and you can transparently switch between them. Y yeah. I and uh, that's, I think, where people think it seems a little complex. Uh, and it is complex, but uh, System D is already capable of doing some of those switching activities now. So this is building on what System D is already doing with its stateless booting and all that sort of stuff. And in this system, everything, as they're calling it, is double buffered or really enfold buffered, depending on your storage, because user and the runtimes and the frameworks and the app subvolumes can exist in multiple versions. You could roll back after, a, after a, a bogus update. You could see how a rolling OS becomes a lot more reasonable because you could individually or completely roll back different components or all of the components. You're doing bit by bit transfers. Uh, what, Wimpy, what do you think of the, uh, the method they're proposing for software installation? Does it blow your mind a little bit? Um, it's a little bit different, but th there are some parallels to to the way that um, we do some things at work currently. So we we um, work almost exclusively with Python at work, and if anyone out there is a Python developer, they've almost certainly come across virtualenv, which is a, a way of isolating a uh, a Python runtime and then installing just the packages and tools that you need for your application into this sandboxed, isolated environment. And it means to say that you can keep that uh, separate from the system and stop the system packaging from stepping on your applications and new libraries breaking um, your, your application. And, and it's uh, more complex, but it's like that. Uh, it's like virtual environments, but for all of your partitions. Right. And 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 in an example, Lenart says, uh, I've got three vendor operating systems installed. He's got, like, I think it was two Fedoras and Arch Linux. He's got KD and GNOME. And and the home directories are shared. And they, using these namespacing concepts in ButterFS, he's free to mix and match apps and OSs 
or develop against specific frameworks and specific versions on any operating system. And it doesn't matter if he booted the Arch instance or the Fedora instance. He can execute both LibreOffice and Firefox just fine because the execution time gets matched up with the right runtime at, at launch time. And all of them are available for all the operating systems you have installed. Kind of, I mean, part as of a, this... As, yeah, go ahead. As a developer productivity tool, that's really powerful because right now if I want to develop against... Uh, the Mate 1.9 branch, for example, I need to boot into a virtual environment with all of that, you know, actually a, a virtual machine with all of that stuff installed and, and develop there sort of separately from my, my main machine. But being able to step in and out of environments like that sort of at will is is extremely powerful and, and could in some in some way sort of usher out the, the hypervisor world altogether. Yeah, and he also points out that one fat binary, if you wanted to, could include all of the architecture. So you could have sort of like when the Mac was transitioning from PowerPC to Intel and you could run either the PowerPC code or the Intel code with one icon. He says the same thing could be possible with this. An installer image could include the Fedora version compiled for x86-64, one for i386, and one from ARM, all contained in the same ButterFS subvolume. And due to ButterFS's deduplication, they'll share as much of the code as possible. And when the image is booted up, the right subvolume is automatically picked based on what the architecture the system has detected it's had. Yeah, brilliant, isn't it? And he says, Here's, here in this new system, it would also make installations of operating systems much easier. Uh, you know, you could do it manually, but you could also automate this. Here is the process to install a Linux distribution with this new ButterFS-inspired subvolume system. You would create a GPT partition table. You would add an EFI system partition to that partition table. You would create a ButterFS volume, obviously. You would deserialize. That's what they call when you write one of these volumes right to your hard drive. You would deserialize a single user subvolume into that ButterFS volume. You would install the bootloader into the EFI system partition, and then you boot the system, and it's done. There's got to be a downside to this other than the complexity. And the other thing is, they, they, he says right in here, he's like, A, we recognize this would take a massive level of adoption. That's why we're putting it out there right now. And he says, we think this could also help us accomplish things like factory resets and power wash features where users could press a button and you know all of their data would be protected, all of their apps, everything they depend on, but everything could go right back to it, defaults. That could be incredibly powerful for users. Um, but they got to get adoption, number one. They got to make sure people are comfortable with ButterFS, number two. And it, the real question is, is how irrelevant does this make a distribution's built-in package management tools? Because for some distributions, their package manager sort of defines them. You look at Arch or really even, you know, dev distributions, there's there's folks that will only use dev-based distributions. That that's a, If you're an RPM-based distro, you're dequalified. This would sort of nullify that differentiator, right? It could do. I mean, you could build your um, framework and uh, application uh, sub-volumes just by compiling and installing the code into them. And maybe, maybe that's the simpler way to do it, thinking about it. Maybe that reduces, reduces some steps and some overhead. So yeah, thinking about it, yeah, maybe it does kill off the package manager. But it doesn't necessarily mean you have to do that. There, there's there's still some value in being able to uh, package things and install things in a reproducible way. Right, yeah. And in fact, I want to talk about that in a second. Before we move to that aspect of it, does anybody else have any thoughts on... It's early days on this proposal, so I know there's a lot of you haven't chewed on it yet. We'll have a link to in the show notes too if you guys want to read it all. But anybody else in the mumble room want to chime up before we jump to... Uh... Yes. Yeah. Definitely. So this is one of those things that I actually think so far from the proposal, I, ca I can see the feasibility of implementing it. I can see the benefits of implementing it, but I think we're misleading uh, a little bit on a couple of things that we gain from not doing that before. Mm. So one of the things is people are now statically linking and the reason we weren't doing that is because there was this major benefit of up the library and get it all updated. Yes, it breaks packages and makes uh, the distro and the package manager much more relevant. However, it does make uh, our applications to be following the path of latest security, the path of uh, the, the latest uh, up upgrades that were made in technology, which is no longer true when you have this kind of hybrid system. The other thing that I also think that this can actually provoke is a situation where 
to start um, just bringing everything to a monolithic state and you lose the distro variety. It's not really the software, it's not really the... Um, I think it's the experience that developers from different distros mm -hmm. are trying to convey to their users. Mm -hmm. And I think that might be harder to tackle, that mm -hmm. philosophical issue of getting people on adopting it than the technical sides of it. Developer, I agree, I that could be a big issue. I understand why Linus also understands and why Linus is looking at it, I don't package for Linux. I mean, I develop the kernel. I want to use whatever my kernel runs. Yeah. And that's why he looks at it that way and he's not packaging it. But to be honest and fair, I think this will eventually become uh, something uh, of the past and be simple. If you want to develop an application, you want to target your end users. Actually, currently, if you're developing a server application, chances are you're developing for a head, Red Hat, OpenSUSE, or something like it. And if you're doing for the trying to get to the end user, you're doing it for Ubuntu. And that's simple. You and are focusing on an OS. For like now. For wow. yeah. And having said that, the Docker idea is pretty cool and dandy, but you're just bringing all your baggage uh, to the desktop of the user. And that's just assuming that our machines are ready to just take it all. Right. And yes, we're, we have the hardware right now. We didn't have it in the past, but I think that's yeah. completely bloated. Yeah. And can be fixed in tooling for developers. Not that, necessarily on this. To, and to that point, you know, the storage point, the chat room is mentioning uh, what about ButterFS storage limitations. I assume as this gets worked out, uh, storage will go up and those things have to be worked out too. I know uh, Heavens wants to jump in and kind of bring this one home and then we'll move on to, uh, hey, while package managers are still relevant, there's some big changes coming that I want to talk about. But first, let's thank Ting. Go over to linux.ting.com right now. Everybody go there. linux.ting.com. First of all, that'll put Linux in your history. Let's, let's be honest, you need more Linux in your browser history because I know what else is in there. And it's not what you want in your history. Linux.ting.com. Go over there. That'll also get you a $25 discount off your first Ting device. If you've already got a Ting-compatible device and you want to bring it with you, well, then good news. They'll give you a $25 credit for a lot of you out there. That gets you more than your first month. So why Ting? It's mobile that is zero BS. You only pay for what you use. Ting takes your messages, your megabytes, your minutes, adds them all up at the end of the month, whatever bucket you fall into. That's what you pay. It's just a flat $6 for the line and your usage includes hotspot, tethering, picture message, caller ID, all the stuff, everything, all of the things, plus more, all controlled by an amazing dashboard. Ting gives you the controls you need to see exactly where your account's at. Maybe turn something off, turn something on, disable voicemail, enable voicemail, set up caller ID, disable caller ID, all those things exposed for you right there in a crazy easy to use interface. Go over to linux.ting.com right now and you can check out there's Ting savings calculator. You put your current usage in that bad mamma jamma, not like what you pay, but your actual usage, and just get an idea of what you'd save by switching to Ting. If you're listening to this right now between 8 a.m. or 8 p.m. Eastern, why not try giving Ting a call? 1-855-TING-FTW. Guess what? No hold customer service. They'll answer your questions right then and there on the spot. It's kind of incredible. And if you if you want to sort of charge up your Ting device, if you're a recent Ting customer, they just posted uh, a great top five app pick from uh, one of the Ting associates, Ben, and he talks about some of his favorite apps for Android. He's got Waze on there and a couple of others for those of you in relationships or not in relationships too, or that one which might break up a relationship. He's got a whole list over there on the Ting blog. You can go over to ting.com slash blog. But do me a favor. Start by going to linux.ting.com. Linux.ting.com. Go grab a device. I've got the Nexus 5 on Ting right now. And I got multi-ROM on there. Well, Rika I did. And I've got Sailfish OS on that bad man. Jamma, Firefox OS on that guy. Uh, Ubuntu Touch and Android L all on the Ting system. It's cool because there's also other Ting customers who are doing the same thing. And every now and then I chat with them in the Ting forums. Yeah, Ting has forums too. They have a great community where people are trying out stuff all the time, always pushing the envelope. Linux.ting.com. Go find out why so many of you out there have switched over to Ting and been super happy. You might just save enough money to buy a new laptop every couple of years. Linux.ting.com. And a big thank you to Ting for sponsoring Linux Unplugged. All right, Heavens, did you want to jump in before we moved off of the uh, new universal package format that's going to save all of us proposed by Linart and the System Decabal? Oh, may I? Yes, sir, you may. <laughs> All right. Sounds wonderful. Well, in a way, this is... Okay, what happens if this wasn't from Lennar? 
would people be more accepting of it or not? Um, I would actually be more skeptical. Yeah. So yes. Right. Well, that too. But there is another situation here, which, okay, most of the time, or way back when System D was just coming out, we were saying there is a future here of Linux that we are going to come to that we have never seen before. And guess what? This is one of those side effects that the creation of System D has spawned. Mm. It's actually one of those future things that we pretty much need because what? Libraries? That's a figment of our GCC linking past just because we need to statically or dynamically link to a certain library in the system. That's pretty much GCC's legacy. Just as rolling distributions and statically released distributions, the Slackware model versus the rolling model, I think those are a figment of the past. This is a very good headway into the, our future when yeah. it comes to partitioning the system. Even though I'm not very much of a big fan of this ButterFS, it just ha so happens to provide the technology required in order to make this feasible or at least not insane. Yeah, I agree there. Uh, it does seem like it is a glimpse of the future that kind of has to come. And, and Crossroads, I and we even... know. Oh, well, we have not really... Uh, well, yes, because Lenart, he has the overview of the system which none of us have ever seen before because this is the future which we are coming to. No one has seen the abstraction level that he has. Mm. He is at that point. Mm -hmm. He's the epitome of where he sees all these distributions and all their problems. He's the person at the forefront. If he can see all these little weird discrepancies and can have a reasonable way or at least an idea on how to bring us forward, He's a pretty good in a pretty good position when it comes to his position, uh, where he is and what he sees to propose something like this. Hmm. All right. So I want to give Crossroads a chance to chime in because he's been waiting. Crossroads, too, though, uh, isn't this kind of a big win for Red Hat? If all distributions are more like Red Hat, then Red Hat wins? Uh, I don't know about that. No. Um, however, look, I think we, we can all acknowledge that this is an issue, that 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 um, developing software for Linux yeah. is more difficult because because of Linux's variety. And, I, and I, I think we can all recognize that that's an issue. And once we realize it's an issue, we have to think, who can solve this? Who in the Linux community, can, or what in the Linux community can solve this, right? Systemd, I think, is the only thing that can because with the exception of Gentoo and Crux and a few of those other things, Systemd is on every Linux distribution, is or will be, uh, on every Linux distribution. So if there's going to be one thing that can unite all the package management of every Linux distribution, it has to be Systemd. Yeah, I agree. I know that's why I made that joke a few weeks ago in Linux Action Show, is it's going to have to almost have to be. Um, and and you almost have to have a company that has some some real reason to put that much effort into the game. And I think Red Hat is that company. Uh, Wimpy, I, I know you wanted to kind of, uh, did you want to touch on anything else before we wrap up on the topic? Yeah, I think Crossroads and Heaven's Revenge have, have totally hit on the right point here. Um, for, for decades, Linux has often been described as a Unix-like operating system. It was n neither one thing nor the other. It wasn't, I mean, when I worked at Sun Microsystems, we used to joke that um, <laughs> it was Solaris for a pro and Linux for show. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah, oh, indeed. Um, and I think that what System D is doing is it's very clearly setting out the future of Linux and it's giving Linux its own identity for the first time, a, a distro agnostic identity. And Linux and System D are going to be the, the future of our platform. And I think people are either going to have to choose to adopt it and learn it and well, like and, it. And maybe or now ButterFS is in that. Yeah, 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 definitely. But I mean, I, I've, I've said that despite ButterFS's foibles, I do use it on my root file system. Yeah, that's why I've been using it too. I felt like this was coming too. It's like Linux has to have a file system with these capabilities. And this entire initiative gives you some insight as to why it's necessary to have functionality like this, to have a, an operating system to overcome these limitations, uh, despite its problems. Yeah, and I and I think the only question that left leaves to be debated is, do we continue calling it 
uh, GNU slash Linux or System D slash Linux in Ouch. the future. Wow! Wow! Well, let's. Wow. I'm going to. Uh, we'll wrap the discussion <laughs> there on that. We'll talk some more. I know Fred's got some stuff he wants to chime in on. We'll do that in the post show. But the show's gone long, even though we didn't get a chance to get Aaron in or the DNF discussion. So, and Eric's been looking at DNF too. So maybe we'll just bust that into its own segment next week uh, yeah. and talk about Fedora's new package manager because we we got to call it right there because I got to get home. But a fascinating conversation. If you're curious, go read Lenart's post. He wants as many people talking about it as possible right now because I think he acknowledges to make this work to make this successful it's got to have huge community adoption buy off you thought system d had to have big buy off no no i mean <laughs> this is right i mean think about this matt universal package management using the file system across every linux distribution you just have to have butterfs support and this version of linux kernel i mean that's the it biggest sounds change awesome ever. but there's so many it's huge changes i mean it's it's absolutely mountain moving and it's one of those things to where you can look at it seven days from sunday and you think you got it all figured out and then you're thinking oh wait what if what if you do that though yeah what if you do that other thing yeah there's so many things that yeah, oh, how will man, it work on mobile devices how will it work on exactly. embedded systems all these kinds of questions right? how will we distribute Very software to yep. switches running linux now yeah, it's it's fascinating, and it's going to be one I think we will probably track for a while as it sort of develops and grows, and we'll be curious to see, A, if it makes it, and B, how much it changes from this point. But uh, I think tonight I'm going to give it another read. I've got it saved up to Instapaper, and I'm going to give it a go-through. But Matt, guess what? Yes. That brings us to the end of this week's Linux Unplugged. Now, I don't know exactly what we got scheduled for Sunday. I'm waiting to hear back from a guest, okay. but I already have kind of like a let's get serious about a, productivity under Linux, but B, how to take the Chromebook and actually make all these Chromebooks that are coming out right now a drop-dead awesome Linux experience. Not a second-class experience, but an awesome experience. How to do that might cover some of that on Linux Action Show. We've got a whole range of topics, so Matt, I'll see you on Sunday, okay? All right, see you then. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of Linux Unplugged. Don't forget to join us live. We'd love to have you here on a Tuesday over at jblive.tv, jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get in your local time zone and jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact to send in your contact info and Jupiter Broadcasting uh, or also our subreddit linuxactionshow.reddit.com is a great place to go alright everyone well if we don't see you on Sunday for Linux Action Show I hope we'll see you right back here next Tuesday Fred, uh, why don't you, uh, in the post show now, get a chance to jump in with what you were going to say? Because I know you were mentioning you're seeing some problems if the distributions kind of normalize out. Um, yeah. First of all, you shouldn't feel that bad. I mean, you have to run the show, and uh, for me, it's really no problem <laughs> if I don't get to speak. <laughs> um, but um, I, so first of all, I'd like to say something about uh, Linux, or at least how I see the whole distribution thing, uh, you know, spanning out. So essentially, it's it's free software and open source is an evolutionary type of thing. Yeah. yeah. So made the best win. Yeah. And um, distributions essentially like branched off to solve different kinds of problems, to sort of even solve the same problems in different kinds of ways. And it's time to converge back by taking the best of each. Right. So, it, it, you know, ah. it, it's really not a problem uh, if, if they all just converge back. Right. Into into a single system. Hmm. It, it's actually a good thing because we get the best of each of them. Right? That's, it. That's a good so, perspective. I like that. Yeah, I actually think it's a, it's it's like the natural course of, of things, right? It is the uh, sort of organic evolution that open source seems to take, where it sort of forks out the strongest survive, and then it gets reincorporated, and we kind of focus on that thing. And, exactly, exactly. And also on that point, um, y you have so much of the differentiation between the different distributions is the low level plumbing that defines them. So it's the you know, ultimately is that you know the package manager and the release cycle. If you take package management and release cycles out of the equation and upstream is now responsible for distributing their their binary uh, sub volume the, the distributions are going to have to focus on the end user experience to differentiate from one another rather than 
technical masturbation. Yeah, yeah. And uh-huh. philosophy and things like that. Oh, I wanted to give, before we go too far there, I, I meant to give a quick plug to uh, Aaron Saigo. He has a uh, Patreon page up. He is bringing back uh, Illumination of Free Software, a, to- a kind of like a talk show discussion show. He's going to have it structured. He's looking for backers. <clears throat> you can go to patreon.com slash L-O-F-S, and uh, I'm a backer. And he's got a video up there talking about what he wants to do. And, you know, we talk a lot about getting um, good open source coverage. And I think the, I think the thing about a Patreon campaign, <clears throat> and just like a Kickstarter, you can back a Kickstarter and get absolutely nothing. Or you can back a Kickstarter and actually get the product. And I think it depends on who's running the project. I think if anybody's going to be able to pull it off, it's Aaron. I think if he sees success with it, he'll keep at it. So go over to patreon.com slash L-O-F-S and uh, kick him a few over on Patreon if you want to. I want to give him a plug for that. It's one of the reasons we're going to have him on the show, but we had some mumble connection problems. Uh, okay. So uh, what about the fact that this is powered by ButterFS? That does seem to be the elephant in the room that we're just kind of glossing over. Well, yes. and no. Sorry, sorry, Fred. Go on. Uh, no, I... Uh, I have a much bigger problem here. Um, so <laughs> Leonard, Leonard is the guy who should be doing this. I, I absolutely agree. He has the vision. He has the view and and everything. But uh, the problems he ta- he's tra- he tackles usually they're quite big. They're complex. They're made of many small parts. And he has always a grand vision, but never a stepwise vision for solving something he's he never gave out like okay now we're solving this little piece and then that little piece on top of that and then and so on he just goes out and says i'm groundbreaking i'm changing everything and you know it's good for everybody might be good for some people might not be good for some people yeah until this day i've been running arch with system d on my laptop and i have some serious problems because i encrypt uh, so I raid my encrypted partitions. I don't encrypt my raided partitions. Yeah, and systemd does not handle that properly. So there are special it cases where. It, right? Sorry. It actually does if you <clears throat> handle the dependencies correctly for your file system startup. If systemd is in your initrid, although I don't think Arch has systemd in the initrid. Hmm. Um, funky. So would say initrid. Uh, so I, I've read quite a bit. I have uh, I have went on the system the IRC channel asking. I've read a lot of the the documentation. My system starts up fine. It does not shut down properly. Okay, hmm. and then actually for debugging shutdown, by the way, I have to log to a text file. So I'm back to you know CSV in its style of logging. I cannot use journal CTL for some reason. This journal D stuff. So. There is a huge fuss, and then there is this one corner case that maybe somebody did or didn't think about, and that they, he didn't manage to cover, or the or system didn't manage to cover or think about it somehow. Yeah, and this is the kind of problem we have in today's technology. And Linux is gonna turn into Windows if we keep doing this stuff. <laughs> Windows works fine. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Yeah, yeah I'm serious because yeah. Windows no, works right. fine for the general case, yeah. not for the corner cases, right? And well, for our this is why case, Linux was so flexible and, and, and susceptible to the, the on a use case basis. That's why it worked fine for so many technical people. But if we're going to keep skipping those, skipping that, we're really going to end up quite badly. Yeah? I also, I think I want to, uh, <clears throat> you know, Blackout24 in the chat room brings a good point that it's not just a Lenart effort. I think he's the name that has clicked the most with everybody because... It does add some credibility to the effort, in a sense. But he uh, his way. Yeah, on but I don't want to. But I guess I don't want to over cult of personality this thing too, because it is not just his thing. However, let's not kid ourselves. He will become if it's successful. He'll have to become the figurehead of this, and it will become Leonard's baby. Well, he's done it before. He might be yeah. able to do it again. Well, he's just simply put, he's one of the the the. The most followed online. He's one of the well, most well spoken. From like a, he'll come at you with a technical rebuttal that is both scathing, but yet also technically accurate. So therefore, hard to quibble with. He's really good at that, uh, and he's got the name brand. So uh, I mean, it's not this is not a Lenart a quote unquote initiative, but I think by the end of it, it'll look like one. Well, a you lot know, of the I, time. I, I just think this tre- this trend continues forward. Is that we keep seeing innovation 
starting around the red hat fedora type people like Lenart. So it's it, I just wanted to point that out. That's pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wonder if our pace of development is getting a little bit too quick in a way that scares most of our technical users now. Oh, one Linux that fits all is not I'd bad. I'd say. Well, I'd you know, say that's, that's the thing that title. we have. Our problem that we have so Linux far title? is our variety. A lot of people bitch about there's too much choice in Linux. This helps, you know, unify. No, I just choose a district. A lot of people just like I mean, to I think, I think <laughs> part of the problem, I think we are part of the problem each time that we go and we say we're using Linux. I mean, seriously, I'm not coming for, for the GNU plus Linux thing. I'm just saying you use a distribution and the distribution represents a whole set of things, not only the kernel. They could, have cha they could actually change. That shouldn't matter to you. When you're using your, your computer, like for us technical people, yes, we care about it. But let's face it, a regular user comes to the desktop and he doesn't know or care about what kernel is in there, what uh, is going on on the, uh, on the background. If it's called Unity, if it's called uh, GNOME, they don't care. They care it works for them. And that's the experience they want. And that experience is under a name of the distribution. That's the name you, you, you go for. And if you do that, a lot of the issues of, oh, it's so fragmented just don't exist that exists for us we like to bitch about it but let's well, face it the user doesn't care the user just wants it to work yeah yeah True. also if we don't allow for change if we don't allow for innovation we can't move forward oh, yeah. just as but, 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 of but, course well, but just a minute a ton of distro so it can always happen he can do it in the distro he's on and if people in there like it, some people like everything else, when it proves useful and it proves to be worthy, uh, it appears on other distros. That's how we work. Yes, not... thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm trying to avoid the whole celebrity hacking topic because, you know, it's funny. The, not to even get into, like, the body parts aspect of the celebrity hacking, but I feel like so much of what we've been talking about building your own cloud team for you know fortress chris or going with own cloud or or sync thing or BitTorrent sync and and all of the you know encryption and all of this stuff and then you just have this huge story that drops that's sort of the personification of all of the stuff that we've been a little worried about people have been a little nervous about and you know it 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 it, it it has it has flavors. If you zoom out and look at the meta story, it has flavors of NSA spying, and, and now it's a new angle to look at that. It has flavors of personal privacy and protection. It has flavors of controlling your own data. It has flavors of what the responsibility of these new corporate overlords that are sort of forcing you into these new systems and these new ecosystems that just do this stuff for you. And at the same time, when one of their marketing messages is, don't worry about how it works. That's the selling point. You never have to think about it, which then encourages exactly these kinds of things to happen. Happen. So I, I think it's it's all it's a huge meta story. So yes, there's girly parts that are involved, and that of course there has to be that adolescent aspect to it that sort of gives it the traction. But I think when you take that away from it and look at more of the violation and privacy aspect of it, and the implications that this, I mean, this is happening to very public figures, and so the reaction is very public, and a lot of people are talking about it and a lot aware of it. But I was just saying a little while ago that if you actually follow the news on this kind of stuff. Uh, this kind of thing happens almost on a weekly basis on a much smaller scale and usually it involves kids and it involves a high school and the shaming of someone and then that someone either sometimes gets suicidal or they have to leave the school. There, There is a very real life aspect to this story. That and I think sometimes when we get when we start talking about it from a technical aspect, we'll talk about it from a oh well they need local encryption or uh, you know we need transparency or uh, the solution is open source code that can be publicly audited. But we forget about the fact that on a much smaller scale and 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 probably realistic on a daily basis, really, if you think about the amount of devices around the world that are out there that this kind of stuff happens on, there there is probably these kinds of violations going on almost daily. But this story has given us the opportunity to actually stop and think about it because it involves people with names we know and faces we recognize. Although these um, these women have had an egregious uh, privacy breach uh, for which there is no apology by anybody, I'm not so sure they were the, the target of this. Do you not think that Apple were actually the target of this in that this is... is 
the timing of this it, it seems to be very precise. Oh, snaps. Look at you, Wimpy, busting wow. out the conspiracy bacon. Very yeah, well, nice, sir. Very nice. Well, okay, where, where's okay, you can, you where's can this bacon it. from? <laughs> yeah. Well, this okay. Is... So, so you know, they're, they're about to have their big unveil. This is the time. Of, this is Apple's time of the year. And, they're going to introduce um, a new payment system, supposedly partnered with Visa, MasterCard, and uh, uh, American Express, right? Built on NFC, probably connected to your iTunes account, I'm sure. Yeah, and, and you look at the scale of what was disclosed improperly. In th- th- This wasn't something that just happened overnight. This must have taken weeks of yeah, planning. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So I, th- I think that, that the timing of this is very deliberate, and I think it's it's designed to embarrass Apple. So it definitely accomplishes those things. It publicly shames famous people for using i products, which is something that uh, you know is a, it's a it's one of these things where you'll see like Samsung will pay a celebrity to take a selfie, and the, like so Ellen, for example, she'll be out on stage, she'll take a selfie with the Samsung camera, and then she goes backstage and tweets about it on her iPhone, and that drives people crazy. So Wimpy, are you implying then that this was orchestrated by uh, someone? Well, I, I don't know who, who it might have been orchestrated by, but I'm wondering if the motivations of the individuals behind it was to was to sort of slander Apple and use some salacious means in order to accomplish that. Maybe it was an wow. activist that wanted to derail the centralization of the payment system, right? I mean, maybe it was uh, like... P- p- possibly that, or possibly it's just simpler. I, I don't like Apple, and I'm, I'm going to, you know, show show them in a bad light and hmm. because I want product X to 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 win, you know, the the mobile wars. I'm watching a video of my daughter right now on the baby monitor at home. I think that bacon was brought to you from Frank's Meat Market in Black Diamond, Washington. <laughs> oh, man. Well, but, it- yeah, I think that uh, reasoning about us as uh, activists or just a few people because the nature of the simplicity of the brute force and it doesn't look like there's been that huge of a technical effort behind it right no right. and also also the other reason why i think this is a, a um uh, an attack i'm not sure if that's the right word an attack on apple is l- looking at some of the files that were taken it's implied that other storage uh, you know, cloud storage platforms were potentially compromised mm-hmm. but those cloud storage platforms haven't been mentioned they've very yeah, squarely yeah, pinned that, this on iCloud I, I do recognize that as well but I also I've noticed just in the tech uh, news industry quote unquote if you can even freaking call it that uh, if, if if the story has Apple you put that in the headline every it does not matter anything else they because a headlines are of limited length and B it, it seems Apple headlines drive traffic. Like you could, if you put micro, you could put Microsoft, Oracle, Amazon, Google, eBay in the headline, and they still drive less traffic than when you put Apple in the headline. So I think Definitely. that might be that might explain that aspect of it. Is that's just the clickbaity nature of the tech media? But I do, I yeah. I mean, I I think it also if it is as simple, if if it is truly as simple as a password breach and perhaps aided by an an, an inadequate um, lockout timer after a certain amount of invalid attempts, uh, then this is truly something that could affect any cloud service. Because for example, if uh, I have a script and a computer and time on my hands, and say Dropbox allows me to do nine invalid login attempts, on the tenth attempt it locks my account. Well, then I would just make a script that tries to log into Jennifer Lawrence's Dropbox account nine times and then sleeps for the hour or whatever it needs to sleep and then tries another nine. And I would let that sucker run for a year, just like people Bitcoin mine when they get nothing, because if you get anything at all, it's going to be such a payday. It's totally worth it. So, yes, it absolutely makes a difference if you rate limit the login attempts. Fundamentally, though, if these kinds of things, this, something this private, something this important is being protected by a password and a password alone, I think that's a failure of the system. And I, I think you can, you, can, you can give some of the blame to the user for using a dictionary password. But I'll tell you guys, 
I've been guessing people's passwords since I was literally in elementary school. I figured out my teacher's password just by looking around at their pictures. I've been doing it for years. Nobody has changed. I mean, I am, I'm getting to be an old person now, and I'm telling you, for 20 years now, human beings have been using the most ridiculous... 25 years, people have been using the most ridiculous passwords to log into their computers, and that has not fundamentally changed. And, you know, it's funny because people think they're really good at picking passwords, and they think they're really clever. But I've been able to figure out my mother's passwords, my father's passwords. I won't say other people's passwords that might be listening. I've been able to figure out teachers' passwords. Human beings are not good at picking passwords unless well, so you are educated on how to do it. The, the nature of this um, attack was to use the Find My iPhone, which I believe you need to supply a, a, an email account and a password combination. And once, once you get a valid credential, just think how many systems that can unlock Bearing in mind, right. the majority of people use the same password everywhere. Email accounts are often used as the um, uh, assert your identity field. So you've now got an email account and a password, and you can just go around trying that at Google, Dropbox, and everywhere else. Well, for most of those, you don't even need to try the password. You just need the email. Yeah. yeah <clears> because you, you, take, you take your email and you go to whatever the service is, and go, I forgot my password. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's one of the brutal things about current online identity is that it's built around yeah. your yeah. email and maybe your phone. Uh, two things which are remarkably easy to get your hands on. Right, so. and especially when you have physical access. Like if you can sit at somebody's desk and then do, and, and you go to any website that they ever visit, and the chances are, even if that website's logged in, their Gmail or Yahoo or AOL Mail is logged in, and you just initiate a password reset, it sends the email to a tab they might already have open on their computer. You open up the email. I mean, it's it's ridiculously easy to, to do this. We talk about this constantly on TechSnap because people... People really, really, really underestimate the quote-unquote value of their email inbox. And really, that's where it's all at. And I think, too, like we have to ask ourselves if maybe if you can't consider a service secure unless it requires more than a password. And, and would it be ridiculous, A, for a company to require two-factor, and B, if any company could pull it off, wouldn't it kind of be Apple? I mean, they do all kinds of stuff that's just like, you can't do that. And then all of a sudden, it becomes normal. Like, what if Apple like required to make iCloud changes like this uh, you know, Touch ID and a password. Like if you have an i, if you have an Apple device that has Touch ID, then they just require you use that as a sense as a form of two-factor authentication. They could do it. Yeah. At least what I see among my peers and people that I know is the reason they how they justify using the same password and the same weak password is because they think, oh, no one will attack me. Or no one will. Yeah, I'm not me. important enough. Yeah, yeah. But, but they don't realize it's not them that someone's gonna try to hack. They're going to attack, you know, you know, Facebook or some site they have an account on. Get all those accounts and then automate the attacks against everyone else. Right. Yeah. 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 Then everybody just gets swept up in it. So, so back to the the app thing that you mentioned about, you know, they could do it. What would be their their motive? Like, what would motivate them to do this? Marketing. I mean, it's a good marketing point, right? And like, and so the, the so two reasons why I think Apple could be the company to do it. One, because they're they'll do things that seem almost like suicidal sometimes. Like they'll do they'll, they'll launch a product that you know kills another product of their own. The other reason is because they're not making money off the monetization of the data. They're making money off the monetization of the hardware. So Google and Microsoft, both of them monetize the data for advertising purposes. But Google's way beyond that. We all understand that. Uh, so Google, for example, like even though they're working on encryption for Gmail, I would be pretty impressed if they ever actually encrypted the actual email contents that they couldn't read themselves because that then they lose out on a huge AdWords opportunity that would probably literally cost them millions of dollars. But Apple, if they can't read my data, if it's impossible for them, if it's encrypted at the operating system level on the device using their 64-bit fancy processor, it, they lose nothing. It doesn't cost them a dollar. Wouldn't that take well, no, longer to costs... send the message, though? I mean, and that, that would be, you know, one of the... But it's, it's not a sexy feature. It's just not a sexy feature. Yeah, well, that's just mm. it. You know, it wouldn't, it, yeah. it wouldn't be a, a, time, a time thing. But I, uh, I tell you what, after, after what's happened, it's a sexy feature now. <laughs> well, maybe. Maybe. I was yeah. hoping the NSA stuff would make it a sexy feature, but that seems to have sort of petered out. Most that's iPhone not, users don't care. They do, I mean, they just don't care. Uh, most people I know really don't, I mean, it doesn't matter to them. It, they don't care. The, the thing about my generation is that we've grown up with Facebook and we've grown up with sharing everything about ourselves. So most of us, 
and I'm not included in that, but most of us really, it doesn't matter to us if our information well, is out there. maybe to an extent, but uh, so take one of these friends you're talking about. They care if all of a sudden their dick's on the internet. Uh, yeah, although as long as their dick isn't on the internet, they'll just say, oh, well, he shouldn't have done that. <laughs> right, I agree, get... but every time a dick or a booby gets on the internet, I think it brings it a little more home, like, because now it's somebody you know, it's a face you recognize, it's a body part, you know, it's not an, it's not an abstract concept anymore, it's, it's a dick or a booby, and I think that is more powerful than an abstract PowerPoint presentation published by The Guardian. That is true. Um, so maybe in regards to, like, the nude they're sending... Sure, that might get them to care a little, but I mean, especially about you know all the stuff that Google collects or all. I mean, it doesn't matter to them that that everyone has a huge database on their life. I bet amongst Joe public, this story has resonated more and made them think more about their own personal privacy and how they use their not just Apple yeah. devices, but how they use these devices than anything that was disclosed by Snowden and The Guardian over the last 18 months. Yeah, yeah. I, I pictured yep. Labor Day weekend here in the United States was millions of uh, U.S. consumers going through and purging their photo streams. <laughs> My, yeah, and then there's the other half of them activity. that were actually going and looking for those other photos. Right, and then I'm thinking, I'm thinking <laughs> hey, you know, maybe I should be taking, some, that was my thought process, hey, maybe I should take some nudie photos. And how would I do that exactly? Polaroid, that's what I was thinking. Just grab if you want to succeed, so, you got to have a sex tape. That's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Jupiter Broadcast can really be catapulted into the spotlight, oh but not God, in the right, yeah. not in the right spotlight. No, <laughs> <laughs> be like a calendar Man. train wreck. Yeah, that'd be... All right. At so work, when um, when Heartbleed hit, yeah. I just quietly went about the business of patching our stuff, and then at the next board meeting, I said, you know, there was this thing, and did you hear about it? Nobody knew what I was talking about. Really? Said, well, really? We weren't affected in the first place, but we've done the necessary things today. My boss comes up to me and says, can I have a word with you for a minute? And I say, yeah, sure. I go into his office and he says, so um, what do you know about this um, iCloud hack with all of these celebrities? Really? So it is great. Uh, I mean, so I think this story bleed, No, not so much. Not on the radar. No. But then this, everyone wants to know. Well, everyone, there you go. It's got everyone's attention. It's another reason to brag about that you have an iPhone. Boobies bring us life, and maybe they'll finally bring us some privacy and concern about security. I feel really bad for those gals that, or the women that had to, you know, have this happen. Oh, I do know. too. I can't imagine if that were like my wife or whoever. I know it's you it's, know it's really awful, and I think it's I think it's important to remember it's not it's not just them it happens to. It's happening on a smaller scale right. that is affecting lives all the time. And uh, time. as as we can't do a lot in our position. But as advocates of free software and as folks, I think a lot of you in the audience are those of you who work with your friends and family to help them, you know, do these things. You have an opportunity to at least help the people around you, show them a, an a, alternatives. Don't be heavy handed about it. If they want, you know, like my mom's using iCloud. I let her go ahead, mom, have at it, whatever. But if you want an alternative, I'm there to help you set it up. It's more secure. Here's the benefits. We don't have to be heavy handed about it. But as folks in our position... I think we do have some uh, opportunity if we want to engage in it to help people with this. Yeah. yeah you know, I, I was just thinking back. It was a couple years ago. I, I saw this on ABC. There was this girl who got hacked. She was like maybe 14 years old at the time. And her life was essentially ruined by all these hmm. pictures that she was taking for her boyfriend, who I believe she's now engaged to or something or at the time of the thing. And they, they, they were kind of risque photos in a lot of cases. And her life was ruined from that point. Everybody, is, once oh, her wow. account got hacked, yeah. um, her high school friends, you know, it <sighs> spread all over the internet. And her high school friends uh, called her a slut and whatnot. And sh she probably wasn't that way, but you know, the fact that they were tr they were yeah. treating her and, that way. And a young person sad. is probably not properly emotionally equipped to deal with it either, which is sort exactly of the part. exactly. Yeah. And yeah. she had to withdraw from school and everything, and you know. This happens every day, and a lot of people don't understand that and don't recognize it. And I hate that it took a celebrity being hacked, or several celebrities, I guess, before this became a public problem. It's like it's, it's like natural disasters. People don't care until it happens to them, or unless it's they right. have, to yeah. have yeah. sympathy. Yeah. What is it? One death is a They're kind of a martyr for our security systems at the moment. And at least right now... We know there's a problem, or at least normal Joes of America and hopefully the world, because it's not just America's celebrities that got used here in this situation. 
the world, or at least a lot of different countries, got involved in this. Mm. At least everyone will know that there's a problem that needs to be fixed mm -hmm. versus just the ladies being mm -hmm. exposed or used for this mm -hmm. sort of publicity. Mm hmm I just hope we don't have a overreaction from the po political side of the spectrum, but we'll see it. Now, I think we'll leave it at that. I think we probably said.